Sitting here on a freezing cold March day overlooking the flooding tide on the Mersey estuary, it's hard to believe that out there on those mudflats we'll be feeding tens of thousands of birds as they prepare to go back on their spring migrations to the far north. Out there there will be teal all the way from Siberia, there'll be red shanks from Iceland and even turnstones go all the way to the Canadian Arctic tundra. Even more remarkable is that in 15 days from now there'll be the first transequatorial migrants landing on these shores. Only 40 days from now we'll have the first swallows returning from southern Africa all the way back to the barns where they themselves were hatched. This short film is going to explain just how those remarkable migrations are achieved. It's also going to show you just how important this one small part of northwest England actually is and how it connects to far-flung parts of our planet. In some cases, they come from near at hand. In others, they may be said to come from the ends of the world. So wrote Aristotle in the third century BC. But Aristotle also believed that the robin, a bird of the Greek winter, transformed itself into another bird, the redstart, during the summer months. Today, we know that its seasonal disappearance from Aristotle's homeland is also explained by the remarkable feat of migration. What is the driving force behind migration? Why has this short-eared owl abandoned its moorland breeding ground to spend winter hunting for field voles on the banks of the Upper Mersey estuary? The answer is food. While the uplands lie frozen under a blanket of snow, making the voles inaccessible, the lowland salt marshes remain snow-free, which means that voles stay on the menu. Soil invertebrates, like earthworms, are a vital food resource for the familiar starling. Each autumn, millions of starlings migrate south and west out of continental Europe. Birds come to the UK from as far away as Siberia in search of a mild climate. On winter evenings, the starlings gather in spectacular roosts. One of the biggest occurs on the Silver Jubilee Bridge, which spans the River Mersey between Runcorn and Widnes. On an October morning, bird watchers gather at Hale Head to witness the southward migration of birds. Recording visible migration by day is relatively straightforward, only requiring a good pair of binoculars. Though a willingness to get up early and a finely tuned sense of hearing is also useful, as most of the birds are only on the wing for the first couple of hours of daylight and are best identified by their calls as they fly over. Many species migrate by day, but many more do so at night. To observe the migrations of these species requires a different approach. This includes low-tech methods like counting the silhouettes of birds crossing the disk of a full moon, or utilizing modern technology such as super-sensitive radar to pinpoint the echoes of migrating birds as they track across continents. For the past 100 years, the most important method for studying bird migration has been through bird ringing. To ring a bird, you must first catch it, and the most frequently employed method today is through the use of mist nets. It takes a minimum of three years for a trainee ringer to obtain a license to ring birds in Britain. The British Trust for Ornithology otherwise known as the BTO, manages the ringing program in the UK. It is the largest ringing scheme in Europe. There we go, chiff-chaff. Check it as a chiff-chaff, very similar to willow warblers. On average, three quarters of a million birds are ringed each year in the UK. 
some 11,000 birds are recovered annually. A small migrant warbler like the chiffchaff has a 10% chance of being recorded again. Each bird ring is inscribed with a unique number and a contact address. In the event of the bird's recapture at another time or place, it is possible to put together a fragment of that individual bird's life. Every retrapped bird helps to build a picture of the life of a species. Where they breed, where they spend the winter, how long they live, and also the epic journeys they undertake during their migrations. Here we go. Black cap warbler. It's a juvenile male. The birds born this year would have a, a full red head. Um, and as the year goes on, the bird molts um, into, to form a, a black head with a few bits of red still left in it, which makes it a bird born this year. This is uh, a black cap. This bird is one of the most important species in the study of bird migration. It's allowed us to learn an awful lot that we didn't know before and this video will help you to understand some of those things. The black cap is a nocturnal migrant and uses star navigation. The Earth's rotation creates the impression of a rotating night sky. Migrating birds focus on a fixed point like the pole star to help them stay on track. Birds such as whooper swans are large enough to carry satellite tracking devices. This brings many conservation benefits. By having a much clearer picture of the routes that different species or populations take, it is possible to reduce the impact that large-scale developments such as wind farms or airports may have on migrating birds. It is also vital in establishing the importance of the key refueling points on the journey. The loss of just one of these stepping stones could have a disastrous impact on the ability of birds like pink-footed geese to survive and complete their migrations. The northwest of England is rich in wetland habitats and these attract hundreds of thousands of migrant birds during the winter months. These concentrations of birds also attract predators, such as the peregrine falcon. Many birds, like these teal, are easy to see, but you will require patience and a little luck to spot rare gems like the secretive bittern. On this cold and frosty morning, we're going to demonstrate how birds fly. To do that, you need a spoon which mimics the shape of a bird's wing. Take the spoon, run some water, and the spoon, I'll do that again, goes towards the water. The curved upper surface of this glider's wing causes the air to accelerate as it passes over. This creates low pressure above the wing's surface. The air under the wing is at higher pressure and drives up towards the area of low pressure and provides lift. Gliders are unpowered and search for rising columns of warmed air called thermals to keep them aloft. Broad-winged birds like common buzzards do the same thing. For powered flight, the bird flaps its wings, compressing air downwards and backwards, forcing the bird both forwards and upwards at the same time. Here at Oxmoor Wood on the east side of Runcorn, I'm absolutely surrounded by birdsong. That includes resident birds like the great tits and the robins, but it also contains the various warblers which have returned from Africa in the last few days. Those include willow warblers and blackcaps. They're busy establishing territories and that's the function of birdsong.
sedge warblers are real marathon champions, with the capacity to fly non-stop for three days from southern England to the south of the Sahara Desert. They require an enormous quantity of fuel to make this journey. That fuel is fat, stored in every available body cavity, even under the eyelids. On takeoff, that may account for half of the bird's body weight. There are many different migration strategies, even within a species. Chaffinches are good examples of differential migration. This is usually related to the sex or the age of the bird. In the harsh Scandinavian winter, only the most dominant adult males can stay to claim the available food. Kestrels in northwest England are partial migrants, with individuals being more or less prone to migrate. British swallows are excellent examples of leapfrog migration. Our birds fly beyond other European breeding populations to winter as far south as Table Mountain in South Africa. Some species are prone to irregular migrations. Birds often arrive in large numbers at places beyond their normal areas. These are known as eruptive migrants. In the UK, the waxwing is probably the best known example of this type of migration. They winter in the rowan belt across southern Scandinavia and the Baltic states. When the rowan berry crop fails, birds are forced south and westwards towards the UK. The early winter period of 2005 brought the largest ever invasion of these birds to northwest England. This greatly annoyed the resident missile thrushes, whose winter store of berries was quickly devoured by the Viking invaders. Many species which specialize in feeding on tree seeds or berries exhibit eruptive migration. The jay is an acorn specialist. In some years, the acorn crop fails over large geographical areas, forcing birds to move in search of alternative food supplies or risk starvation. The severity of winter weather can be a major factor governing bird movements. The UK is the winter home for millions of wildfowl and waders. While continental Europe lies in the grip of ice and snow, the typically mild and wet winters of Britain mean that birds like the lapwing can still get access to their soil invertebrate prey. As spring approaches, Migrant lapwings return to their continental breeding grounds, leaving behind the local birds to carry out their own domestic duties. All birds renew their feathers on a yearly basis. Wildfowl, like shell duck, molt all of their flight feathers at the same time. This makes them vulnerable to predators. To reduce the risk, they fly to quiet locations rich in food. The Mersey estuary attracts 19,000 molting shell ducks each July and August. Here I am at Fiddler's Ferry Power Station in the upper Mersey estuary. And behind me here, on an ash lagoon, we've got a sand martin colony. Young sand martins are great explorers. Once fledged, they search out potential future nest sites. When they return from Africa the following year, their sandbank nesting site may have been washed away. But their juvenile explorations gives them prior knowledge of the alternative nesting opportunities. A pioneering spirit and the ability to fly are important survival tools. The little egret began to colonize the UK in the late 20th century and already breeds as far north as the Mersey estuary. At the same time, the avocet, the symbol of the RSPB, the world's largest conservation organization, has also begun a rapid expansion along Britain's west coast. 
These are not the first pioneers of the modern age. Today, the collared dove is one of Britain's commonest birds. Yet anybody under the age of 30 would find it hard to believe that the very first bird only arrived in 1952. We're here in the heart of Urban Witness. We're going to see one of the greatest birds of the world. This is the common swift. It feeds and breeds around urban areas, but it's one of the world's great migrants. Let's take a closer look. The common swift trawls the summer sky for flying insects. They time their arrival to coincide with this flush of aerial plankton. But they depart very early in August, well before the insect population begins to decline. This strategy means that they never rely on the unpredictable food supplies of autumn, essential for a species so entirely adapted to feed on the wing. Though the timing of a migration is critical, so too are the routes that different species take. Many wading birds, like the ruff, breed in the Arctic tundra. They arrive shortly after the spring thaw, where they feed on a massive hatch of emerging insects. By August, they begin a rapid departure as the long, dark cold of the Arctic winter starts to take hold. The ruff heads down from its Siberian breeding grounds, skirting the coastline of Scandinavia and on through the UK. Though small numbers remain for the winter, the majority forge on, only stopping occasionally to refuel before finally making landfall in their African wintering grounds as far south as Senegal. Ruffs, like most wading birds, migrate mostly at night using star navigation. During the daytime, they navigate by the sun. Day-flying migrants like the goldfinch also use solar navigation. Many of the UK's goldfinches migrate as far as Spain or North Africa. Though a proportion of British goldfinches have always wintered in the UK, increasing numbers of birds are taking advantage of the abundant food supplies at garden feeding stations and altering their migration strategies accordingly. Not all of Britain's birds are migrants. Some, like the tawny owl, spend their entire life on their breeding territory. Similarly, great spotted woodpeckers are very sedentary, only dispersing a short distance during their first autumn. Familiar garden birds like British-born blue and great tits rarely stray far from where they hatch, though their continental cousins sometimes migrate long distances and regularly turn up in the UK. Some birds switch habitats between seasons. The great crested grebe is a common breeding bird on well-vegetated lakes throughout England and Wales. As autumn turns to winter, the birds lose their spectacular head plumes and head for shallow coastal waters to hunt for fish in ice-free conditions. For many other species, Britain's wetlands provide the perfect winter refuge and reserves like Martin Meir provide access for people to enjoy them without causing disturbance. In the case of these whooper swans, they leave their breeding areas in Iceland, pausing briefly at traditional stopovers in western Scotland before reaching their final destination in the South Lancashire Mosslands. They are joined by vast numbers of other wildfowl, including widgeon, teal and pintail that breed across northern Scandinavia all the way to Siberia. All of these birds have a vegetarian diet and the largely snow-free conditions of the typical British winter guarantees an abundant food supply. How do the birds follow the routes that will take them to this safe winter haven? In the case of geese and swans, the process is a learned one. The young birds stay with their parents for a year or more, learning the traditions of their migration, including those all-important refueling stops. For other species, the process is innate. 
the birds have a built-in navigation program which guides them on their first migration. This was discovered by detailed experiments carried out on birds like the black cap that featured near the beginning of this film. If a migrant is successful, the route is reinforced by compiling a map memory of their journey. Birds that fail in their migrations inevitably perish and so never pass on the faulty programming that leads them to their early death. Migration is a very hazardous adventure and most birds fall victim to exhaustion, starvation, bad weather conditions, faulty navigation or predation. For those that survive the trials of migration, the rewards are great. Abundant food supplies mean they can raise many young and pass on their successful genetic blueprint to future generations. Migrant birds provide us with a clearer understanding of the connections that bind the remote regions of our planet. A young Scottish-bred osprey leaves its nest and heads south, breaking its journey to refuel in the Mersey estuary. After a day or two, it flies on, eventually crossing into Africa, where it again spends time feeding. The bird's final destination is the west coast of Africa. In its second year, the bird heads back north and claims a breeding territory in an estuary in northwest England. The successful return of a migrant like the osprey is a symbol of hope for the future of our natural environment. As the Earth orbits the Sun on its tilted axis, it gives rise to the seasonal changes in food supplies. Food is at the heart of bird migration, and the power of flight and the urge to migrate are the tools that allow birds to exploit this fundamental property of life on Earth.